virtual machines. So, as you probably know, uh, GPUs are used to accelerate graphics rendering, uh, for instance, to play video games, uh, for design and modeling software, uh, to play video games, that's important too. <laughs> For data visualization, what you see there is an example where we show in real time about one billion data points uh, using this visualization software. Uh, playing video games, in case you forgot. Um, they are also quite good for any kind of parallelizable computation. For instance, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, you have here a training set. Uh, for that NVIDIA uses to train the AI for driving. Uh, human gen genome analysis, high quality 3D rendering, so when you don't do it in real time. Um, now for those of you who are interested in GPUs, uh, at SIGGRAPH 2018, about three days ago, NVIDIA announced a new generation called the Turing, and for the first time they claim they can do real-time ray tracing. So why does it matter? Because it's actually not that new. Um, our friend Ulrich Drepper uh, at DEF CONF uh, Czech was talking about GPUs being something like 120,000 threads that you could use at the same time. So how can you waste that much CPU power? Well, thanks to a guy named Inuge Quiles, you see the, his photo here, he's, working for, he's been working for Pixar and companies like that. So here is a, a very simple example. So this is real-time ray tracing. Um, so you can see that the, the bottom there, uh, you can see all the pictures. If you want to check that this is real-time, this is the actual time, the clock. Uh, it's a clock, you can check with your uh, that with your, your, your own clock that it's the right time. Now this is pretty naive. This is something I did about six or seven years ago. Uh, you can do much better now. For instance, you can do that now. Uh, so this is the same idea, a real-time clock. Uh, you may recognize a daily work, you know, the molten clock, but now it's showing the real time. Uh, and you can do a number of different effects, uh, characters, landscapes, um, this is a realistic looking rock, except you will see that it changes shape over time. So this is all computed now. This one is taxing my GPU a little bit here when running uh, Full HD. You can create moods. So all this is done in real time. This is not a movie. Uh, you can create landscapes that have physically nonsensical features. Okay, so how does it actually work inside? Um, so the first level at the top there, the application, uh, is going to call an API, uh, there are a number of graphics API like OpenGL, Vulkan, etc. And then that's going to go through a GPU driver which sends that in some proprietary for format that I call the graphics bit stream on the chip uh, through the, the chipset driver in Linux in the kernel. And um, some graphic card is going to render that in a frame buffer, and then the frame buffer is going to be converted to a digital signal that goes to your screen. Now, um, the computer acceleration that I told you about, for instance, for artificial intelligence, follows a similar path, except, of course, there are different APIs, and you don't send the output uh, to a screen. Now, why would you want to virtualize GPUs? Well, one reason, for instance, is compatibility. Um, for software development and testing, if you want to run a GOS, a game operating system, like Windows, for instance. Um, for flexibility, um, this can allow you to have video streaming to thin clients, to this enable cloud gaming. And uh, of course, all the benefits you can get from scalability, management, etc. For uh, you can get with uh, graphical. Uh, devices as well. Now, in terms of large scale deployment, this is a Titan uh, supercomputer built by NVIDIA. So, this is mostly done, the, most of the compute power in this kind of things now is in GPUs. And of course, we can have swarms of, of GPU accelerated nodes. Okay, so 
Um, the problem is that when you want to actually virtualize this, there are many, many solutions, and it's a bit complex. The simplest and most naive one is to have a full device emulation of a VGA class driver. So this is really how we did it in the 2000s or something like that. And uh, the good thing about it is that it's very compatible, for instance, with old software, um, old hardware, and it works at guest boot, so you can emulate that before the firmware is even loaded. Um, so it supports practically all the virtualization features. You can do migration, stuff like that. You can have as many concurrent virtual machines as you want. And, um, and you can have remote access to it. I'm going to talk about remote access at the end of the t this talk. Now, the, the cons of this approach is that it's very slow, because you are emulating a device that was not designed for virtualization. It has tons of legacy quirks, like memory. It doesn't feature 3D. VGA doesn't have 3D by default. So if you have 3D, it's all software. No compositing, so no matter on desktop. And, um, so that's basically the reason why you want to move to something else. And the next step up is to basically use a virtualized kind of interface that you're going to expose to the guest. And your graphic API now talks in sending some specific comments that are going to be converted by the host driver. So now you have the guest kernel in there. And, and you have a, a virtual driver that talks to the actual driver. It's slightly more complicated. It's obviously simplified in this picture. But this, basically now you're sending a stream of, of uh, virtual graphics comment, and, and the rest, the bottom of the stack is the same as before. Now the pros of that is that you can accelerate 2D. You can get some 3D. Um, basically, what you don't get is specific card features. Um, it's flexible. Uh, the cons is that you can't expose the vendor features from the card, because now what you're exposing is a, is a virtual device that doesn't have the actual card features. So. Um, that limits the virtualization features as well, and the performance is at best medium. Uh, you don't get direct buffer access to the card, stuff like that. So it's basically, you can get multiple VMs running at the same time, but you don't get the best uh, performance. Now, when you run multiple virtual machines at the same time, there's another difficult problem, which is that you have to schedule rendering on a device, the GPU, which is not necessarily designed for that. Uh, context switching on a GPU is problematic. And so uh, resource allocation is also an issue, because now you don't have a dedicated car for one, you know, one guest workload. You have to share it. Um, and uh, the GPU capabilities are hard to expose, as I mentioned. Migration is tentative at, this, at the moment. Part of the problem be, being how you, you, you feed back the screen outputs. If you switch from one host to the next, then the, 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 the graphical output is going to switch from one machine to the other. So you lose some of the benefits. And remote access is a problem in this case. Where, where do you put the remote access con control in there? So the next step in order to get better performance is to do GPU device assignment. Uh, so basically, in that case, you pass through um, the graphics API directly to a vendor driver that resides in the guest. And now it talks directly to the hardware through vendor specific commands. So now you're poking a hole through the virtualization layer there. Now that, po that, that hole can be somewhat, you know, the safety issues can be somewhat mitigated, um, but that's, uh, it's, it's really how you do it. So the pros of this approach is that you get uh, near native performance in the best case. Now you're talking to the card directly. You have good compatibility now with new features because now you can see the card so you can know what, you know, what kind of features it exposes and, and therefore uh, switch to a more modern um, rendering API because you use the vendor driver in, in, in effect. So you get the latest APIs, you get the best graphic features. Uh, the cons is that, for instance, the boot console is a problematic in this case uh, because uh, you, you, you're no longer connected directly to, to the hardware, so basically you get a black screen. Uh, the setup is not very flexible because it's attached to a specific VM, and migration is a real problem in that scenario. No sharing either, I'm going to explain in a minute later uh, why not. So the next step, uh, to see the difference between these two cases, I have to switch back and forth so you can see, because the difference is not completely obvious, but the main difference is how we talk to the hardware at the lowest level. So there, um, we are going to find a way to share the same CPU uh, across multiple VMs. So uh, in, in the single uh, GPU case, you have, uh, so that's, that's a vGPU case, basically. We split. Uh, 
a GPU between multiple VMs, and now that's a GPU that knows how to be split and knows how to support virtualization. So we get some compatibility, same, same benefits as before, but you get multiple VMs, and that's the big benefit here. Now the cons is that you still don't have much flexibility. The hardware requirements are high because now you need uh, a lot of, uh, of extra GPU power uh, because you are going to split it across machines, and in general it's done in a static way. Um, migration and the features like that are still problem, problems. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, when you do this, when you do this kind of device assignment, it might seem you know, very simple. It's just, you know, I take a GPU, assign it to a VM, what could go wrong, right? So um, it, it turns out it's, it's not that easy. Uh, you need hardware support, not just in the GPU itself, but in the, uh, in the chipset as well, because you need some kind of isolation between the GPU and the memory it can touch. Um, so, and you need to be able to enable the IOMMU, for instance. Uh, and then there are a number of hardware quirks that you need to be able to deal with. So in terms of topology, you have not completely isolated things like you would um, in a, uh, when you, for instance, virtualize a CPU. Now, this is, in a sense, relatively similar to what, you, what happens with NUMA uh, when you go to, to virtual machines with CPUs. So what happens now is that your devices might have you know, some sort of arbitrary topology in the physical world. And so um, now you can create your IO MMU groups and split them in any way. So now, as, as long as you have a single GPU, it looks fine. You know, it's a basically a straight line, so no, no real issue there. And if you have two GPUs that are connected to the same PCIe bridge, they can basically talk to one another. It's all within a given peer-to-peer uh, -peer domain, and you can have two GPUs that enhance one another, can talk to one another, etc. Now, if you have multiple scenarios like this, you're still through the same bridge. Um, but if you have to go through uh, interprocessor communications with uh, QPI, for instance, could path interconnect, then it becomes much slower. And of course, so that means it's not transparent. Uh, the, the, the way you lay out your GPUs is not completely transparent, and you have to, to deal with that. Which means that from a management point of view, uh, device assignment is not something uh, that is as simple as, for instance, allocating memory or allocating GP, uh, CPUs. Uh, in, essentially, at the, at the moment, it's really host spinning. And this means it's not really designed or not very applicable for a cloud style of solution at the moment. And I'm talking about the case where we're not really showing. So in order to mediate, mitigate that, um, we, we want to use the MDEV framework. And in that case, you're basically exposing uh, through Linux. There's Linux, in that case, is going to give you an interface that gives these mediated devices, uh, so MDEV, um, that lets you uh, uh, get the kind of isolation you need in virtual machines so that uh, you can still talk directly to the memory of your device, but they can't overwrite to some other location. And then you can still get it. Now, MDEV is a really complicated topic. I can't cover it today. Uh, but I invite you to uh, look up this presentation if you want to, to see exactly uh, what you get out of this. Now, um, the problem is that it, it exports a, an interface that is not very easy to manage at the moment. Uh, there are things like a, a type description, number of instances, etc. And uh, all this is at the moment completely vendor specific. So you sort of have to have your management software learn uh, the details of what's inside. And there are a number of things that are not exposed, like device quirks, uh, driver limitations. Um, whether it can support multiple instances or not for a single VM, these kind of things. Like, all, all the stuff related to licensing is, is hard to manage it that way as well. So uh, I exposed a number of different um, ways to split your, your GPU. And if we try to compare them, well, uh, we see that native GPU will give you best, best software availability and performance, for instance. And then you, you switch to emulated GPU. That's performance takes a big hit. Scalability takes a big hit, but you gain in security and, and flexibility. And so if I keep going like this and try to compare all the various cases, I see that there is no one big win. It's not like there is one that is the best. 
um, it's really uh, a series of trade-offs. So this is why it's still very much work in progress for everybody. Uh, for instance, in terms of features, um, this is relatively recent announcements uh, for live migration of NVIDIA uh, GPUs. I'm sorry, the, the one before there. Um, this is a demo. So I was telling you about the problem with migration where you see that it switches from one monitor to the next. So if you have to run across your data center in order to see the output of your uh, of your machine, that's not that's not very convenient. So uh, another thing that shows that it is, uh, this is still very much work in progress is that all the resource allocation and sharing is still very much on a per vendor basis. Uh, the choices are not completely set, which means for that from a management point of view, there is no single way to do it. Um, so to take a Facebook analogy, it's complicated. <laughs> Now, if you add remote access on top of this, so Spice is a Red Hat solution for remote access, and, um, and, and it tries to, to address some of the issues we are talking about here, uh, notably about you know, things like migration, etc. So most virtual machines are used remotely, and so when you connect to them in a data center, you're going to basically get a, a stream of uh, video updates. Now, um, this enables a number of, uh, of use cases like cloud gaming. Uh, you can stream high quality 3D to your phone, for instance, because H.264 and streams like this are, are completely as asymmetric. It's much easier to decode than encode. And so you can have a big heavy machine that does the encoding in the, uh, in the cloud and then a lightweight machine on the other side for visualization. So this means you can bring your work environment to any devices. It has many nice features. So for KVM users, uh, the solution for, to, to get these kind of things is Spice. And we're working on, on making Spice uh, basically streaming capable like this. So to explain a little bit the, the evolution compared to what exists today, um, you can have multiple, yeah, there are multiple ways to do remote access. You can do it either from the guest or from the host, and uh, historical solutions would be sending 2D comments, basically. To, so they will intercept drawing comments somewhere and send them over the wire, run of them on the other side. Now you can intercept them uh, in the guest, and that would be typically for uh, Microsoft Remote Desktop or these kind of solutions. Or you could have, uh, the, in, in, in the case of Spice, the Spice server do it for you, in which case you get the remote console as well for your VMs, etc. For video streaming, uh, it's more or less the same idea. You can do that from within the guest, or you can do that from within the host. Uh, I'm going to show the, the trade-offs in a minute. So what happens when we, we, we do this is that instead of sending graphics common in, uh, in a uh, device-specific format like we did before, instead we are going to switch to network kind of graphics. So if we that from, do that from the guest, for instance, if you were using terminal, uh, uh, Windows Terminal Services, you would use something like that, where there is in the guest some kind of software rendering stack, and then it sends the data over the network, and you're basically using the virtual network um, the normal way. Now, when you do this, this is widely available. Most operating systems now have this. You know, it may be as simple as X11 uh, in the case of, of Linux. Um, it's transparent for most users, but of course it's, um, it only works after the guest has booted, so you have no console in that case, and it does require that the guest network works. Now, why is it important? Because in some cases you may want your guest to be something you can access remotely, uh, graphically to do something, but that the network is not going outside. And you want the network to stay uh, look, uh, constrained inside the VM. Um, and so that's why we have also host-based remote access, in which case, so in the case of Spice, we have uh, uh, a Spice server component that will do the encoding. And the way this works then is that we have basically a driver in the VM, um, in, in the VM, uh, in, in KVM basically, that is going to intercept 2D comments and behave mostly like a VGA, then transmit that to the Spice server, Spice server sends that over the network, and you have a Spice client on the other side that renders that as graphics. Now, that, that works pretty well for 2D, but it doesn't work very well for 3D. So if we want to do 3D, we do, we do need some kind of streaming, so something like that looks more like um, uh, we, we have an encoder that generates video on the fly, 
Now, if we want to that, do that with vendors like NVIDIA, they really insist on doing this in the same way as is being done for virtual GPUs. Um, and so remember that the, in the vGPU case, what we had was um, that the, the GPU driver resides in the guest. So that's why you need to do the encoding as well. So that means basically that you are encoding H.264 from your frame buffer within the guest, which means that you need in the guest some kind of agent that is going to send the data over, and you send it to the other side over the network. So uh, this is a little bit complicated to set up, and, and it has the same kind of drawbacks as we had before, uh, because, because now you have to wait until it's booted, and you have to have an alternate solution pre-boot that shows you the, the console before you boot. And so finally, something that is not done yet, but, but I hope that it will happen within maybe the coming year or something like that, is to do host-side streaming, uh, still using hardware acceleration. And so in that case, um, what we do is uh, we, we send the graphics uh, down there, and we still have the splitting abilities that we talked about before uh, with the GPUs. Now we're using the vendor GPU driver here, and, and we do the encoding host-side, um, meaning that now the, 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 the whole uh, network stack happens here. Now, if you do this um, uh, that way, um, then the, the, the nice problem to, that you have in this case is that you need to find a way to share the features, uh, share the encoder, share, uh, um, share the frame buffers, etc. Now, why is this a problem? Because now your graphics API is doing the rendering in this side, right? So it's doing basically all the rendering is done in the guest. And you need to find a way to pass the guest data, preferably without copying it, in a way that uh, the, the host driver can see it. So there are some developments that are going on in the Linux kernel at the moment to try to enable that. But it's a relatively complicated problem. Um, and so you have to realize that, for instance, the rendering may happen at 60 or 120 frames per second. So you need to be able to pass the data uh, from the, the guest, I did a guest user space down to a host kernel um, without copying it. So that's that's pretty, pretty expensive. And um, and I'm actually done. And I did I spoke too too fast. <laughs> so I'm out of time. I removed a number of slides compared to yes. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, because uh, in the Kubernetes community, uh, when, whenever, you're, um, whenever you request a GPU, then you, you get the whole GPU. And sometimes you might not utilize the GPU fully, right? So it's very interesting the work that you're doing here with splitting GPUs. Um, so this vGPU, if I wanted to try this out, where would I find this? Okay. Um, so some of the stuff that I showed is actually working today uh, with... Um, well, okay. When you say you want to try it out, under which kind of conditions do you want to try it out? Like, like I, I want to download it. I want to install it on a three, three node or five node uh, but this Linux is cluster. This is for experimental purpose. You're not production kind of use, right? Yeah, this is yeah, probably going to be experimental, but. Uh, um, it, because the part of uh, with, with, with you know utilizing GPUs in Kubernetes is that limitation of not being able to split how, how much resources. If you want to request how much uh, CPU you want, you can you can do that, but you can't apparently do it with uh, GPUs. Yeah, so um, at the moment, this is still a lot, uh, very much work in progress. So if you want to have. Um, VG oh yeah. Okay. okay. So NVIDIA vGPU is uh, supported in RHEL 7.5. So if you want to play with it, I think you could with CentOS, but you have to buy the um, 
grid software from NVIDIA. Yeah. But it's supported, as, as I understand today, it's still supported in queue configurations today, so one-to-one. -one. So it means it, doesn't, it can't split, I think. No, it supports vGPU. But not with, not with Spice yet, that's all. Uh, okay. Yep. So, so it's supported with RHEL 7.5 and with um, Rev 4.2. But I don't think you want to set up Rev or Overt. So you just have to get the Grid 6 software from NVIDIA. So is there an open source alternative like OpenCL, for example? Mm, no, so at the moment, as far as I understand, none of the uh, vGPU capabilities uh, that NVIDIA offers are supported by Nouveau, for instance, if that's what you're asking. Like, yeah, o OpenCL is an alternative to the so for OpenCL, okay, I, um, I would need to check because uh, my understanding. So apparently, my understanding and, and Karen's are different. My understanding was that at the moment, Nvidia was still uh, offering only uh, one queue, well, basically whole card configurations and that the rest was uh, still unsupported configurations. Karen says otherwise, so I think I, I'm probably wrong on this. Uh, and maybe this is only for remote, remote viewing. Um, now for, for compute only, In full open source, I don't think there is anything that works. If you want it full open source. So Intel is also working on vGPU. Yes. So KVM GT. So that would be fully open source. Yes. And okay. There's another question in the front. I understand why the streaming agent approach is not ideal, but are there uh, any open source streaming agents I can use right now with over slash rev or with, you know, KVM and libvirt? So the streaming agent itself is open source. And there is, uh, it's basically built so that there are plugins in the, which we are trying to open source because they use uh, APIs that are normally public, so there is no reason we could not open source it. But it's still under discussion whether we can actually open source that or not. Um, now, the fully open source one does not use a hard hardware acceleration. That's the problem. So it, it basically does NJPEG encoding and stuff like that which is all in software. So it's good for testing purpose, but it won't give you the hardware accelerator. It will give you hardware accelerated rendering, but not encoding. Okay, uh, I mean, I know that Spice does MJPEG. Is that part of the Spice, uh, like, guest agents and all, or? Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, this part, it's built in the Spice guest agent right now. And now, and now there are other, you can, of course, uh, use other solutions like VNC or like uh, TGX or whatever. Um, uh, so if you use VNC, for instance, you will have, you know, very fast rendering on the card, but you will get very slow transport over the network. Okay, and there's lots of, but there's lots of proprietary streaming agents, though, I guess. Um, yes, you, yeah. you have, as I, as I mentioned, you have TDX as an example. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Uh, Thank you. Okay. No, there's, no, there's another one. So, uh, assuming there's three hardware vendors, uh, you know, NVIDIA, uh, AMD, and Intel, do you have to buy professional uh, graphics adapters uh, for uh, VG, or, uh, virtual GPU, and including Intel, do you have to have like a Xeon and all? Okay, so um, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, uh, the, the, you, you really, so in order for this to work, you really need good support for IOMMU. 
From the card side, um, it, it really depends on the vendor. vendor. Each vendor has a different approach. So for NVIDIA, you typically want recent cards. Uh, to get vGPU, you really need cards that are uh, dedicated for this. For historical reasons, AMD used to have uh, the uh, IOMMU support baked in earlier. It doesn't necessarily mean it's better, it's better supported in Linux, but at least from a hardware point of view, older cards have better chances of being isolated. It doesn't mean that the driver support is good. So, and for Intel, um, Intel is, uh, is working in a very open source way. Uh, so uh, their own approach is, um, from a software support point of view, uh, it is nice to have. The problem is that the performance at the moment is not the best in the, among the vendors. Yes. Okay, but like, are those are those harder features on, uh, only in like the quadros rather than G fours, and only in the Radian pros well, rather than the Radians? Yeah. So as Karen said, it's worse than that. It's specific software. At least in the case of Nvidia, it's specific so uh, a specific software license. So the great software, um, and basically, you're, in order to activate that, you have to talk to a grid server that tells, okay, you have to you are license for this or that configuration. So it's not just the hardware. Okay. It's also it's also a software license. And it, there is also a specific read SDK um, that lets you take advantage of some of the features. So for instance, I was mentioning that we're using public APIs for uh, for the streaming agent, that's part of the, this grid SDK, for instance. So APIs like how to capture the frame buffer, how to stream it, encode it, stuff like that. <coughs> Looks like we are out of questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. And sorry for talking so, so fast. <laughs> So I have a question. So, 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 so,